Hello everyone, my name is Ollie. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Warwick. This video is going to be about Gillick competence and the Fraser guidelines. Now this is going to be a slightly tricky video because it's about how we deal with certain situations medically when children are involved. Just as an outline, Gillick competence is the idea that even sometimes relatively young children can consent to medical treatment despite being under the age of 16. And then the Fraser guidelines tend to come in when we're talking more about contraception. So we'll go through each of these ideas in turn and break down exactly what they mean. And we're covering both in this video because they both arose from the same legal case, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. So firstly, Gillick competence. Um, Gillick is a person who we will talk about in a minute. What do we mean by competence? In day-to-day -day English, competence, you know, refers to your ability to do something. If something is within your skill set and you're able to do it, you would be deemed competent at it. However, it has a slightly different meaning in a kind of psychological and medical context. In this sense, competence means your ability to consent to treatment. Now it's worth noting out, competence should not be confused with capacity. They're often used interchangeably, but they're not exactly the same thing. Someone's capacity is their ability to make a decision and then communicate that decision to someone else, who is obviously usually a health professional. But competence is more, I would say, a functional definition. It's, is someone suitably impaired or impinged such that they can't make a decision? So now that we've got that out of the way, what is Gillick competence? Very simply, in the kind of broadest definition, it's the area of medical law that comes into play when deciding whether children who are by definition under the age of 16 can consent to medical treatment with or without the consent of their parents. So this all stems basically from the same 1985 case that was brought before the House of Lords. And I can't remember the exact name of the case, which I should have looked up, but I think it's something like Gillick and West Norfolk Department of Health or something like that, a regional health department. And the reason that's important is that there was this circular, which is basically like a leaflet or a pamphlet, um, circulating around this local health department, suggesting that prescription of contraceptives and contraceptive advice was a matter of the doctor's discretion, not ultimately the parents, if that makes sense. The case was brought by Victoria Gillick, who thought that this should be illegal for two main reasons. The first being that this could be seen as the doctor offering either contraceptives or contraceptive advice and therefore encouraging this person under the age of 16 to have sex, which is itself an offence. And also, if they were to provide this treatment without the consent of the parents, that would amount to battery because the child is under the age of 16 and therefore that child wouldn't be able to consent by themselves. That consent would lie with the parents. So obviously if the parents weren't informed, you were treating the child without consent, which is battery. So long story short, this all went to court, obviously, and the verdict was this, which I'm just gonna have to read for you. Lord Scarman says, as a matter of law, the parental right to determine whether or not their minor child below the age of 16 will have medical treatment terminates if and when the child achieves sufficient understanding and intelligence to understand fully what is proposed. And that's essentially it, as far as Gillick competence goes, because of that ruling in 1985, a doctor now, in order for a child under the age of 16 to consent to medical treatment, the doctor has to be reasonably sure that the child is kind of suitably intelligent and emotionally mature enough to fully understand the treatment, the nature of the consent it requires, and the consequences of that treatment. And if all those things are true, the parents don't have any right to overrule that child's consent. They may not even need to be informed, obviously depending on the nature of what's going to happen. So just some quick further points which you might find useful if you're asked in an interview. If for whatever reason such a child was not found to be competent or lacks capacity, then someone else can consent on their behalf to treatment, which is usually going to be a parent or a legal guardian, or in some cases the courts. There are of course cases, for example, where you might have two parents who disagree about what is in the best interests of the child, and technically a doctor only needs consent from one parent or legal guardian in order to provide treatment. That's all the consent they need. However, it's obviously good practice not to antagonise either of the parents, so what usually happens in these cases is 
no progress is made until an agreement of some sort is reached. If for whatever reason an agreement between all the parties involved can't be reached, then it goes to court who will ultimately arbitrate what is in the best interests of that child. Now there are some finer points of consent and capacity to talk about, particularly when it comes to children, but I think that deserves its own video, so we'll talk about that another time. So the second part of today's video is the Fraser Guidelines, and Gillick competence, that set of rules and criteria was brought in by Lord Scarman, but one of the other lords involved with the case, Lord Fraser, had a slightly different set of criteria that are used instead now for when you're providing contraceptive advice or prescription. Now it's a five item list of criteria that need to be true in order for a doctor or another suitable health professional um, to provide contraceptive advice or contraceptives themselves. And crucially, if these criteria are true, it allows that health professional to make these interventions without the consent of the parents or necessarily even telling the parents at all. That's up to the child. So the five items are, firstly, that the young person is actually going to understand the advice that the professional gives them in the first place. Number two is that the young person can't be persuaded to tell their parents, either telling them themselves or having the health professional tell them. The third one is that the young person is likely to begin or to continue having sexual intercourse with or without the contraceptives or contraceptive advice that the professional would give them. Number four is that unless that young person receives that advice or treatment, that their physical or mental health is likely to suffer in some way. And then the last one is that the young person's best interests would dictate that they receive those contraceptives or that contraceptive advice with or without parental consent. And I think the first items map pretty well onto Gillick competence. The child obviously has to understand the consequences and the nature of the information that they're being told. And obviously you would try and inform the parents as well. As I said before, either the child can tell the parents themselves or the doctor or health professional can offer to write a letter or have a phone call or inform the parents in some other way. But that doesn't have to happen. If the child refuses for that to happen, that's fine, you just proceed. Then the third was that they have to be either having sex or thinking about having sex with or without the contraceptives. The fourth one, the one about their physical or mental health suffering because of not receiving intervention, I find this one slightly unusual, not because I don't think it's a good idea, I think it's an excellent idea, but having seen a few of these consultations myself, and it's something we, we have to know quite a lot about in medical school, I've never seen the degree of suffering either to, to physical or mental health that would have to happen in order for this one to be true. I've never seen a, you know, they would have to suffer this much. And I mean, from what, what I have to assume is the case, the risk of STIs and unwanted pregnancy obviously massively disturbing to a young person, so I assume that that is enough to satisfy that criteria in virtually all cases. It does seem almost impossible to imagine a circumstance in which safe sex practices are not going to be in someone's best interests relative to unprotected sex. I'm sure situations like that do exist, I just can't think of any, so be sure to let me know in the comments, obviously, if you can. Ultimately, what are the take-home messages of all this? The main underlying point, as in virtually everything we talk about, is that medical treatment has to always be in the best interests of the person receiving it. If a young person is going to be having underage sex, fully regardless of whatever you think about the morals surrounding that issue, as long as everyone's consenting, obviously, then personally, you know, I've got to argue that someone having safe, protected, informed sex is virtually always going to be a better situation than someone not doing those things, particularly if they're going to be put at risk because of it. You know, obviously I'm in a situation where I don't have children, but in, you know, maybe in the future I will, and I would like to think that one day, if I had children and they were having underage sex and I knew nothing about it, that at least there were guidelines and, you know, good health professionals in place to protect them properly if that's where they decide to go. I think having these guidelines in place is a really, really important thing. So that's where we're going to wrap it, guys. Thank you very much for watching the video. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to go and check out my social media pages. I'm on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and check out postgradmedic.com 
as well where you can find all my interviews, videos and articles pertaining to med school and med school applications and leave any questions or comments down below. Take care.